New Hampshire with operations in the UK, India, Romania, and the Netherlands. Turbocam makes critical parts for aircraft and rocket engines, turbocharger, and industrial turbo machinery. Well, that's a pretty impressive resume. Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's nothing compared to the exploits he's done for the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Jesus. The stuff that God has led him into and strengthened him to do, that I'm reminded of Revelations 12, 11, where he says, and they overcame him who is the accuser of the brethren. He's the him. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Amen. And they did not love their lives to the death. Yes. Marion is one of those. Let's welcome Marion Nolona this morning. Yes. I thought I was the speaker today. But I've been ministered to by you today. Do I need the mic? It, it, it's helpful to hear okay. everybody. Okay. It's not that bad. Okay. Um, you know, uh, John, when he was singing, standing outside your gates, I would stand outside your gates. I thought of a time I was in Taipei in Taiwan and uh, I was in a hotel and uh, I met with a man by the name of Chao Ye Wu. He was uh, one of our suppliers and right there I got to share the gospel with him and he accepted, he chose right there to pray with us to follow Jesus. I never saw him again. But you know what he told me? He says, all his life, and he was probably, let's say, in his 50s, all my life, I walked past this church, and I looked inside, and I never knew if I would be able to go inside. And now here we are in a hotel and I get to meet Jesus. What an amazing story. Amen. Amen. Now if you go back to, uh, if you go back to how did the gospel come to Taiwan? How did, you know, there's so many people who have laid down their lives for the gospel to be in Taiwan, for the gospel to be in China, okay? Tough, tough, tough going. People who laid down their lives, people who never went back home, okay? and. Here I am, you know how so many times you share the gospel with somebody, well, I hit, you know, I hit a single. I didn't know what's going to happen, but I did my bit. You know, it's nice when you're on the other end, okay, it's a home run and you didn't do anything, okay? That's what it was like. But you know, the words that you were singing in that song, that's what I was, that's what I was, it was coming back to me that is this guy a worshiper? Has, be, has he been a worshiper for 50 years? But he didn't know his God. And he felt that he wasn't welcome in, in to this church. I, and then in Taipei, sometimes the churches are, it, it's, you have very, very narrow frontage. So you have a door, and your frontage might be only this, but then you go inside, and it's much bigger inside. Okay, and uh, I just peeked. I just peeked into a couple of churches, and then my 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 partner Keith Lynn, um, he was introduced to me. He came here for training, and then um, you know I was sharing things with him at different times, and then finally he flew back to Taiwan, and he sends me a letter. 
He said, as soon as I came back to Taiwan, I went south to see my mother, and I told her, now I have come back to God. I said, whoa, I didn't know that that was happening. You know, I knew he was under a lot of stress, financial. Um, how was he going to hold up his end of this deal? But I didn't know, you know, sharing something here, sharing something out there. And the result of it is, he goes back to Taiwan and is now determined to follow Jesus. And th so that was probably February. I went back then in May and I said, okay, I got to introduce you to a church. Let's help you find a church. And in Taipei, um, there's a big green and on, on the green, there's a Built, there's a road that goes all four sides and um, off the green there's this I think it's called loaves and fishes I said, let's go inside and then let, let me pray let me pray um, uh, Jacob's prayer okay if someone will come out and welcome then this this is the place for him and you know we went in out there and there was a worship group and they were practicing but no one walked up to us and said hello a few months later he found a Lutheran church on the street not far from him and that's where they discipled him that's where they grew him up in the Lord that's where he thrived unfortunately this year he's he lost his sight and so we've had to shut down our um, our business in in Taiwan um, we aren't shutting it down but you know he's retired and uh, and uh, but all these things have happened all these these things have happened part of it for gospel businessmen I don't know how many of you are businessmen but you're in the world you're in the working world and in the working world we touch people all the time okay and we touch them in a way, you know, they won't walk into a church. And frankly, that's fine by me. If God is touching them and He is using us to touch them, mm -hmm. then there's a way for us to bring that light into the world. Yes. Okay. And um, Bob, Bob has known me since I was brand new here in New Hampshire. So, um, you know, uh, what he's saying out here is we are this light. Sometimes I think we see more darkness than there is. And sometimes I think we get intimidated by the darkness. But even a small light pierces the darkness. Okay. And all it is is speaking up and, and, and loving people and communicating something. In fact, my, my mess up, I should have invited a guy here. Um, I thought about it yesterday and I didn't get it. But I met a guy two nights ago. I, um, there was this startup company in Rochester and uh, uh, I went to their kind of their open house in a, one of those old mill buildings, dark, kind of grungy. And, uh, I was talking to this guy Dan, and uh, he said, "Okay, I've heard, you know, I've, I've heard about you and this and that and the other." But I just started just talking to him as if he was a believer. Okay, I just started to talk to him about, you know, the things that I do. Um, you know, I want, I, I want to see people know their God, yes. and it was. You know, sometimes you take some time footsieing around before you talk, you know. But I just got to the point, and he was so blessed. And then his name is Dan, and I said, do you know the story of Daniel? And he said, of course I know the story of Daniel. My name is Dan. And I said, you know how that guy was a light in such a dangerous, dangerous place? And he, he lit up. He said, oh, I'm so good. I'm so glad we, you're talking about this. So 
<laughs> all the other people around him, some of them were a little drinking, a little too much, a little loud. And in the end, he just said, uh, he, he just wanted to talk to me more. And I'm saying, you know what? It isn't that dark. There are people who want to be encouraged. Now, I jumped in out here in about sector three of my talk. Um, so let me start from the beginning. <laughs> Uh, I grew up in India, very Catholic family. Um, I had an uncle who was a priest, I have an aunt who was a nun, she's in her 90s, she's a fantastic woman. Um, my brother is a Christian brother, my uncle's a brother, uh, sorry my cousin. My great aunt was a fantastic nun, so I grew up in such a Catholic family, but I never knew God. And I went through um, all Catholic education, um, from parochial school to boarding school for seven years, to Catholic college for two years, and I did not know God. And um, when I was 18 in engineering school in the north of India, I just walked away from everything. And I came up with my own uh, theories of who God was and, and everything. I eventually got to this point, I think I was 21 by then, and I said, stupid people, rosaries, sitting on park benches, happy. I am so brilliant, and I'm the most unhappy person in the world. Better to be happy and stupid? <laughs> but that was actually probably the start of faith for me. Better to be happy and stupid. Because actually, we do, we do have to be a little stupid. We do have to be a little stupid. We do have to be a little, you know, believing in this and believing in that. We don't believe in the tooth fairy. But you know what, in the end, we believe, we believe in creation. And frankly, if you look at Abraham, what was Abraham doing sitting under a tent? He's looking up at those stars and saying, I'm not worshiping those stars. Someone put those stars. Okay? So um, I'll fast forward a little. When I was 10 years old, I decided I was going to America. But I was, it, it was partly, I'm going to go to America and join the US Air Force. And some of the things we prayed about earlier, you know, that God has made this country a special place. I saw America. I don't know how much I, I read a lot now. I think I've always read a lot. And maybe I read, uh, I don't know what I was reading, but I knew enough about America that America was not a colonizing country. Okay? that it had fought wars for freedom. And then it left those people in their freedom and went back home. Now, I grew up at a time in, in India where uh, independence from England had been 1947, this is 1964. So it wasn't that far away, people talked about it. But India was a colony, okay? Um, so there was, there was a certain amount of residual anger against the Brits, you know. But to me, I wanted to go to, to America and join the US Air Force. Of course, everybody left. Um, but that was fine. I kept doing things. In fact, uh, I think uh, the year before that, I heard about the Berlin Wall. And I went back to my desk and started designing a machine that would go under the Berlin Wall. <laughs> and I kept it to myself, and then one of my buddies found out about it, and and then you know they all started laughing at me. And uh, but I developed those drawings, and um, maybe the next year, because postage was about one month's uh, allowance. I was in a boarding school, um, and I sent it to the Pentagon with whatever address I could figure out. <laughs> Pentagon, White House, Washington, D.C., something like that. 
and never heard from them. And uh, I sent it to them again probably three, four years ago, uh, later, and still didn't hear from them. But the Air Force Academy wrote back to me, and um, uh, so I was going back and forth with the Air Force Academy, and uh, finally finished high school. I finished high school early. I was, uh, and then I turned 16. I went to the uh, U.S. consulate in Bombay, and they kicked me out. They said, there's no such place. You can't go. Forget it. So something I've been working on for years kind of went poof in front of my eyes. So I went to, I went to college in Bombay, studied science, and I went into engineering school for five years. And um, during this time, I, the only thing I knew, the only thing I knew, being in a Hindu city with 4,000 temples, my class was 400 kids. I think there were two Catholics, maybe one Muslim, and the rest of them were all Hindu. Okay, and I came to the so and here on campus there was a huge Hindu temple, and I saw Hinduism. I saw the ugliest stuff. I said, if there's anything there, it's going to be Christianity. But I had I had no. I had no connection to this. So um, I left India in 77. I was 23 years old, and I had $6 to my name. So I went to Montreal for graduate school. I had five Canadian dollars, and I bought one US dollar, because a, a US dollar was a little cheaper than a Canadian dollar. But also, it was sort of my promise to myself, I'm not going to Canada. You know, that's my stepping stone to get where I want to go. And um, probably did everything wrong in Canada. Sometimes I'd walk across, um, there'd be snow banks this high on the road, and there was a Catholic church on the other side of the road where I lived. So I'd go off in my flip flops and climb over this thing, run across the road, climb the other snowbank and go in and sit out there and it's all in French and at the end you know the priest shakes your hand and I didn't know anything <laughs> but all my experiences and if there are any Catholics here I don't mean to offend um, but uh, I, I just I just did not encounter anyone who taught me about Jesus and then I got to the U.S. I pushed my way in. I chased this company, and finally I said, I'm coming to work for you whether you pay me or not. <laughs> so I came out here. I worked for them for a month, and then they offered me a job. And so it was actually May of 79 that I got here semi-permanently. Um, had to fight for a visa. Finally got a lawyer down in New York City and um, got my first one-year visa about a year later. Mm -hmm. So um, as soon as I did that, I went and bought land with $1,000 down and borrowed the rest from the seller. And I started building a cabin, 10 foot by 16, on the side of a river in Vermont. Um, so. During that time, during that time, uh, the first month I just had a deck and studs, and I stapled plastic all around. And uh, every night going to bed, I'm looking through the plastic, and I'm seeing the stars. And I think my first prayers, I'd call them my, I would call them my first sincere prayers. Hey God, you there? I bet you know me. I bet you remember who I am. You could crush me like a bug right now. Because uh, not having grown up here, I had done a week of uh, 10 days of outward bound that year in, in middle of February. So I'd done two days of solo and about minus 20 degrees, and I had some confidence that a bear wasn't going to jump through my house. 
Okay, but still, you know, just covered with plastic. You know, feels kind of vulnerable. Um, but it was that was that was really my my first connection with God. Fortunately, about and I, I probably did this every night. And finally, about two months later, now you've had Dave Zeely speaking here, okay? And Dave Zeely led a church at Dartmouth College. And one day I went to Dartmouth College because I had my regular job, and then everything was building. And then this, sun, this Saturday, I walked into campus, for, and I went to a concert of Indian music, and there was a gal out there whose outreach was to foreign students. So she, we were chatting, she invited me to a meeting. I said, is it a mass? I'd never gone into anything other than a Catholic church. Is it a mass? No, it's a meeting. What is this? Anyways, nice gal. I went to this church meeting. And the worship was probably 45 minutes, 50 minutes. On Catholic churches, you bug out at about 25 minutes. You know? <laughs> as soon as you can, you bug out. And Sunday it might be 40 minutes. You know, you you stand at the back and you bug out. And if you don't want to go in, you stand. And they put speakers on the outside, so people who are standing out, they call them outstanding Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> but you know. You went, you showed up, you bug out. And here people are worshiping. And then, oh, okay, this must be the end of the meeting. No, it's just starting. A two hour meeting, and people just singing their hearts up, people worshiping, people praying. And then I think it was Dave Zeely preaching that day. I said, that's the best message I've ever heard. But you go to, you know, did you, did you go to seminary? Tell me how this works. Are you a priest? What are you? Anyways, during during that summer, people found out, oh, you're putting on your roof. We'll come and help you. Really? You're going to come 16 miles all the way out to the woods and help me put up my roof? That's what people did. But prior to that, when I was building, I found that if you asked your neighbor for help, then you owed him help in exchange. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the way it worked. Now this town where I was was Thetford, Vermont, and it was the center of the nuclear freeze movement. Okay, it was thick. They counted themselves the first town to vote against nuclear, anything going through the town. You know, some goofy stuff, but um, if this is peace and love, I didn't see it. But I saw it from Christians who came out to help me. And then someone says, small group is at my house. And I didn't know what small group was. So anyways, I went to this, uh, this family's house and really enjoyed their hospitality. And then they found out that uh, I would only go and eat. You know, I had to cook up something after I went back home at 9 o'clock. They said, from now on, you come out here and have breakfast, have dinner with us before home group. And uh, and then they'd send me home with leftovers. You know, th this this was, I'd been in the country about a year, year and a half. And uh, if you've seen the movie An American Tale, okay, it's that story of an immigrant mouse, a Jewish immigrant mouse. Okay, what's that? Uh, something uh, ought to be in America where the streets are paved in cheese, the cheese. You know, uh, you, know uh, you got to go to America, set your mind at ease, something like that. I can't remember the words, but you know, the streets are paved with cheese. And then you arrive in New York, and it's not paved with cheese, you know, and instead there's cats. Oh, that's the song. There are no cats in America, and the streets are paved with cheese. There are no cats in America, so set your mind at ease. And you come into New York City, and there are cats, okay? So, 
you're landing in a, in a different country, you don't know a soul, you make friends with whoever you try to make friends with. That's right. Okay? But now, for the first time, I'm meeting really good people. And that summer of 1980, that's where I met Dave Zeely. That's where I met, uh, in fact, we moved here uh, three years later, um, and some of the people who moved with us to start a church at UNH are still some of my closest friends. Um, so that summer, after going to after going to church for three months, after going to home group for three months, after even going to men's prayer on Friday mornings at 6 a.m., and even one day, as I'm driving up, I pick up my home group leader on the way, and in the meantime, I picked up a hitchhiker. And I'm sharing the gospel with him, and I don't even know the gospel. Okay? And my, and my home group leader says, so Marion, have you made a decision to follow Jesus? And I said, well, I don't have a visa, and this, and that, and the other. I don't know where I'm going to be. And he just threw, threw me a throwaway line. You put your trust in Jesus. Jesus looks out for you. Okay. So I was building wind turbines. That's what I was a specialist in. And I put up a windmill that Friday. And on Saturday morning, it crashed. And I said, oops, there goes my job. There goes my visa. There goes my cabin and my land, my house, and everything I have built is gone. So, and uh, there was a, a there was a altar call that Sunday. I said, "Yep, that's me. I want to follow Jesus. No more up and down." This is where I'm going. Amen. And um, I used to run my cabin on my car battery. So I had two car batteries, one for the car and one for the house. And every month I swapped them. And that's how I charged it up. OK? So I had one 12 volt light bulb. And I, and <laughs> and I would try to read my Bible by the light of a 12 volt light bulb. Um, and every month, you know, one month was walls, the next month was windows, roof, insulation. November 1 came, I bought a wood stove, 100 bucks, okay? And, uh, and uh, then I got baptized November 20 in a nice swimming pool in West Lebanon somewhere. And then this gal comes up to me and says she's been in India, and I was chatting with her. Well. That was November 20. Our first date, I invited her to help me put up the walls of my outhouse because the ground was frozen. And, uh, and then we got engaged on Christmas Day. So that's my wife, Susie. She didn't come today. She says, I've heard it before, but um, uh, she also had some things to do today. Um, and we felt that God had called us. She was born in Santa Monica. I'm born in Bombay. How far apart can you get? What's God doing up there? We felt that God called us to the nations. Jesus. So uh, we moved here in 83 to be part of a church plant, uh, Dave Zeely, others. Um, and so we moved what we had in a U-Haul, bought a house after two days, because we knew what we were doing. We're right here, church campus. OK, go to a realtor. I want a house for under 40000 within two miles of campus. That's not happening. <laughs> well, we bought a house for $55,000 four miles from campus. OK? And um, at that time, we had a, we had a, a one-year-old. And then the next year, 84, we said, let's go to India and see what God is doing with us. And um, we had a miserable, we had a miserable time. Susie was pregnant with our second. 
and um, she was miserable. Not very nice mother-in-law. My mother wasn't being very nice to her, couldn't figure out who these non-Catholics were, you know, <laughs> wanted to take our son and baptize him in the Catholic Church, all of that kind of stuff. But the, we were there for about eight weeks, and Susie was starting to get morning sickness again, even though she was in month six. Or, and um, so we said, let's go and see if there are Christians here. And we had barely gone a hundred yards on a Sunday morning and we heard worship. Did you hear that? So we followed our ears and went into a college classroom and then there was, there was a church of about 70 people led by a man named Duncan Watkinson. His wife was Indian and they were leading a church much like ours here in Bombay. Um, that was 84. Um, by 85, I was not getting any bites to get a job. In fact, when we, when we left 83, in 83 from Vermont, I'd written 178 letters with this little finger, okay? All over the country looking for a job. And a friend of mine says, let's take a day, pray and fast, and ask God to give you a job. That was a Tuesday. We prayed and fasted. By Monday, I had a job off. And I was now writing software for the underneath of shoes. Okay? That's how I got into this field. Um, so I knew, I knew that this thing came from God. Two years later, again, contracts over, etc., and um, I, st I, I became a U.S. citizen on a Wednesday. On Thursday, Friday, a friend of mine and I, we walked from Portsmouth to Concord. President Reagan was coming to town, and we wanted to do a walk for life and present him with a baby elephant. <laughs> nice Republican pro-life sign. <laughs> Um, and then Monday, I started looking for work, got my first contract. Um, I felt like God wanted me to do this. But the barrier to entry was humongous. A computer system was $300,000. My net worth was about $6,000, $8,000. Okay? But um, I got... I got an, an opportunity to make, to program a part like this. Now, I didn't know anything about this, so I bid it for $5,000. I thought that would be a good month's work. Three months later, I hadn't made any progress. And by now, I've got two little people, a wife and two little people, and I've got bills to pay. And so our home group started praying for me. And I had a desk downstairs with just a Bible on it. I didn't want to get distracted. I'm easily distracted. So I kept just a Bible down there. And God showed it me how to do this on a Monday morning. Okay, three months have gone by. I've tried everything to make this thing. And God just showed it to me. That breakthrough. Now, this software was designed to make the liquid oxygen pumps on the space shuttle. And nobody actually knew how to make this stuff. And I'd heard about it and I said, I can do that. And they said, no, you can't. You're just going to get slammed against the wall if you try doing that. And so I go and I do this thing. And I, I, I I've broken through. I've broken through and God has shown me how to do it. By, so that was a Monday. By Thursday, I had finished. Friday, I drove down to Massachusetts, take the programs to a machinist. He's seen me coming, you know, crash and burn, crash and burn, crash and burn. Okay, what you got for me today? <laughs> it's going to crash and burn. And his eyes pop out. Whoa, this thing is working, you know? How do you do this? So uh, because of that, I got invited by GM 
to make, and eventually I ended up making all of GM's torque converters from 86 to probably about 10 years ago. All of their torque converter prototypes wow. were made by us because of those breakthroughs. Okay, so, so here's the question. We know that if you're sick, you go to God. Okay? But the church, in general, seems to stop out there. We pray for health. We pray for sickness. Because Jesus did that, right? But what about the coin? Remember when the Pharisees were chasing his, his disciples and saying, you haven't paid your taxes, your temple taxes? What did Jesus do? Go fishing and you'll find a coin. Get that coin and pay it for your taxes and mine, right? So how come we don't talk about that? But God was already showing me that um, what I was embarking on was much bigger, much bigger than what we had dreamed of earlier. Okay, so what we had dreamed of earlier, 1982, September 82, back in Vermont, number of people in our church were really poor, and we are helping people, you know, they're poor enough, but buying oil, buying firewood, insulating people's homes. Okay, people on, on, on WIC, people on welfare, all this kind of stuff. Okay, um, and so we sat down together, a bunch of us sat down together at Burger King and said, what is a Christian company? Who owns a Christian company? How do we create jobs? How do we train the poor? How do we plant churches? How do we support missions around the world? And we are dirt poor, okay? And now God is starting to show me this stuff to buy. <laughs> I told you, the, the computer system was 300,000. The machine to make this kind of thing was 160,000. My house was worth 60,000, okay? And yet, over the years, God showed me different things at different points. And um, I had to, I learned to just plain ask, but sometimes I think I don't even ask. Sometimes I don't know. <coughs> Um, that meeting in Bombay led to us starting a company in, in India in 89, five years later, with Duncan and others. I gave him $300 and said, here's the first down payment, and we'll fund you $1,000 a month. And uh, that's how we got that company started. Now, of course, I'm one of those big famous guys in India, so I go speak here, speak there. And someone says, tell me about your prayer life. I said, I don't have a prayer life. I outsource my prayer to India. Which some people think is really funny. But the fact is that I think I do have a prayer life. And I think it is, I think it is, just sensing what does God want okay now please don't listen to me and say Marion has no prayer life he's got no business talking to me and I'm gonna be like him okay you guys all probably have a better prayer life than I do okay but then what am I doing how am I, how is God doing these things I think that I'm walking about thinking about the things that matter to God and then saying is this what you want me to do? These people are dumping a million dollar opportunity at me. Is this from you or is that from you? Okay, and trying to sense a piece of how to go forward with this. And then, uh, like you talked about, a guy getting a check for a thousand dollars, okay? When I walk into a customer I pray for a man of peace. So you know how Jesus sends us to 72? And he says, go. Sometimes you'll be welcomed. Sometimes you won't be welcomed. And if you're welcomed, go live with them. Pray for their sick. 
pray peace on this house and stay with them and enjoy their hospitality okay that is being the answer for us that is being the answer for us we walk into a company or a company contacts us and in the end was this an open door from the Lord and if it is then it's just a welcome it's amazing things happen but I I did a lot with GM but I never got a dollar from Ford and I never got a dollar from Chrysler okay I say then God just opened the door and many years later after our customer retired he came and visited us and now I knew he was a Christian I didn't know he was a Christian. I did not know that God had opened the door for us for years. Now, 99 was our worst year. We dropped 20%. And every year the bank balance, every month bank balance going down, 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 down. But um, during that year, someone went into uh, this lab with all this product that we had made for years and threw it all out into the dumpster. They said, what's this rusty stuff? Threw it all out into a dumpster. Okay, now we normally did 400,000, 500,000 a year with GM. That year they had to replace all this stuff. We got eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars worth of work from GM that year. Is this the way God provides by someone throwing stuff out? <laughs> I don't know. <coughs> am, I, am I supposed to, am I supposed to say, Thank you, Lord. I'm celebrating because someone else. But they, they went into the dumpster. They tried to go to the landfill. They couldn't find this stuff. <laughs> How am I doing for time? Stand thirty. You're good. You're good. You're good. Okay. So, um, the story of the story of how we ended up in Romania also was like that. You know, I told. I told my GM in in uh, Netherlands, I said, let's see if God has got something for us in southern Russia or Eastern Europe. This is this is the mid 2000s, okay? The so, the post-Soviet world has opened up. There's opportunities for churches to go in, and I'm thinking, you know, what can we do? Is there are, are there markets out there? I, I look for a church need and a market need. Okay, if there's a church need and a market need, then maybe we can do something out there. And um, uh, by now, so 2005 by now, India's probably got um, 50 people. Okay, it's stable, it's not thriving, but it's stable. Okay, what does God have next for us? So uh, we find out we find out about a couple of Dutch people who have gone into Romania and tried to start a business there. And one's a Christian, one's not a Christian. So we go, we visit, we look at this place. My gosh, it's a white third world country. Dirt poor. That is what the Soviets did to this country. Okay. Um, you're just seeing gypsies, you're seeing horse-drawn carts, beautiful place, but so, so sad. Everything is communist, cement gray, L rows and rows of apartments, okay? Everything is just cement colored, there's no color in the place at all, okay? And I'll say that since over the so many years since we've been there, you see a little more color. After a while, the ground floor had a few signs color. Then the next floor up, you've got advertising, you've got color. Now you see they painted their balconies. Okay, all the balconies, are, they're still the same old cement buildings, okay, but they're starting to, there's some life coming into it. and and. Uh, you know what? Uh, uh, what of you were talking about um, a wasteland? Was it you talking about a wasteland? We are called into this wasteland. 
um, of need. There's so much need out there, and you start to see that need. You just start to see that need. And um, what people, what, what you don't realize that has happened into into uh, these places. For example, I have I have a young guy who comes out here for training. He's staying with one of our engineers. This guy is talking to him, tells him to do something. No response. No response. No response. Finally, he blows up and shouts, "Oh yeah!" Okay, these guys respond to shouting. They respond to fear. They don't respond to ordinary communication. That can you imagine? That is the culture of a country. After intimidation, 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 and now you're trying to teach servant leadership. Now you're trying to teach people. That's not the way. You don't lead by shouting at people, and people won't listen. Okay, so you're trying to re you're trying to change a culture. That's what the church is doing. Now you're doing it through business. Okay, so um, that first trip in the end, I said to our, there were two guys, both Dutch. I told one guy, sell your shares for one euro and get out of there. This is not going to work. Okay, but then. We met a guy out there in that company, and he was going around telling other people there's this American and there's this Dutch guy, and they're looking for a Christian company. They're looking. They want to start a Christian company. They're looking for an engineer. They're looking for. So there was a guy called Soren, and one day he's called to preach at a church because the pastor has something wrong with his face, with his mouth, and he can't preach that morning. So Soren meets this guy, and he says, okay, that's me. He and his wife try to come out to meet Ono, but their car goes off the road straight down in a snowstorm, calls up this buddy. The buddy picks him up and finishes the trip to Budapest uh, airport, where he meets Ono. Ono tells me, we've met the right guy. So I said, I'm flying through to Amsterdam. Can they come and meet me in Amsterdam? They drive out 14 hours and meet me in Amsterdam airport. I'm start. I'm learning about, in probably 45 minutes in an hour, we're talking in the airport. Um, tell me about this, tell me about costs, tell me about people, tell me about, okay. So I'm trying to put together a business plan right out here, you know. How much will you need to pay for rent, for this, for electricity? Can we get this? Okay, what do we have to pay you? He says, this is not about me. This is God's work. I'm here to make it happen. And there I found a guy who does not love money. Because if I'm going to do this stuff internationally, I cannot have people who love money. Okay? The fact is, I'm able to give people six checks, six blank checks, here, deposit one every month. You know what? Because of trust, I can do things for a fraction of the cost other people are doing. You know, I'm starting up, I'm, I'm starting up things in other countries where other people first they want to hire lawyers and hire this and hire that, and I've got, I've got no coverage. I've got no coverage. I'm writing things down and saying, you agree, you agree, you know, you're doing it on email. This was before all the fancy stuff you could do today. Okay, so our agreements are by email, no signatures. Why? Because you know where we're going, the Lord, I know where we're going, and we want to achieve this together. So I believe that trust is a measure of what you are willing to lose. Trust is a measure of what you are willing to lose. Where do I get trust from? I believe that one fine day, there's God on the throne, and I'm walking up to him on judgment day. At that time, I belong in a bug zapper. Psst. Okay. 
But Jesus comes and says, he's one of mine. And that's what saves me from the bug zapper. Okay, I trust that Jesus will take care of me when I stand in front of God. If I, if I have that trust, then trust needs to ooze out of every pore in my body. Trust needs to be something that is part of me. Okay, now my kids, others think I'm kind of naive and I'm easily taken advantage of. Possible. Possible. But I need to rebuild trust in our society. Okay? And how can I do that if I'm suspicious at every step? So, for example, at our company, we decide, okay, um, we'll buy a bunch of snacks so people, when they're hungry, they don't have to go running off to the store. We buy a bunch of snacks, put a basket out here, throw your money in. Looks beautiful. Okay? And it, and it gets bigger and bigger. But then we go from 100 people to 200 people, and some pilfering starts to happen. And right now we have 500, 600 people, and the pilfering is a lot 30%, 40%. Are we going to shut this down? So we say, you know what? Forget this. Don't pay for the food, just put it into the basket for charity. And now we have 10 charities and the charity of the month chosen by employees. Okay? Still this bill, Frank. <laughs> I don't know why. But you know what? <coughs> I keep fighting for this. I keep fighting for this. Um, and, and in India, we started this, built a big building, which is meant for you know business training and church training. And people like uh, Yellow Pages and IBM and Microsoft would come and rent this place from us when they're onboarding their employees. And we put a refrigerator out there with all the sodas and all that and said, here's how it works. This is the trust refrigerator. Okay? These people were blown away. They said, wow. And everyone's paying faithfully. And they said, but I had, a, I had a memo out there, you know? Why do you have holes in your pockets? Because you keep your stupid little keys in your pockets. They make holes in your pockets, right? You, get, you lose your keys, right? What if we didn't have to have our keys in our pockets all the time? In fact, when we moved here from Vermont, in Vermont I always left the keys in the ignition. Moved out here and one day I mentioned it to a cop and he says, you're the guys cause trouble for us, leaving your keys in the ignition, okay? But keys were always in the car. You never had to worry about where they were. See, you know, there are so many things like that. You come to my PC, it's on, you need to do something, you just do it. So this is, this is just an example. This is just an example of a culture that you put into a community by being willing to lose. Okay? Now one day someone came from outside into this trust refrigerator and cleaned it out. And I said, you know what? Fill it back up. There's a risk. There's a risk. But you're trying to communicate that this trust that God He put it into us. Okay? Frankly, Think about this. Can we be Christians if we don't trust that Jesus is there on Judgment Day? Right? It's an honor for me to be here. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for blessing me. Um, I hope what I'm saying is something that you can use, um, but, but uh, frankly, I think our light belongs in the business world, it belongs not in church on Sunday, or with the people we choose to associate with, but we can interact with people because, you know, we can, what do you do, this is what I do, you know, we can interact so easily with people at work, and 
and, and business is the way we've gone into many, many countries. And we're welcomed there. And uh, uh, in fact, think of this thing. You're going into another country as a missionary. What do you need? Language, culture, travel, um, being able to connect and talk to other people. Supposing you're a mid-level guy in a company and you're told, go to Kazakhstan and do this for me. You need language, culture, travel, communicate with other people. You see what a, what a missionary does and what a business leader does are the same thing. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, we're going to pray for, for Mary. Okay? Just, just lift your hands towards him. Lord, Lord what, what can we say? That, that you would take this brother. And what you've done with him, Lord, and how you've showed him so many things. And Lord, we, we all need that. And we all need to be like Mary. And to walk in your light. And to trust you. We need to trust you, Lord. And we just ask that you continue to use Marion to, to build your kingdom yes, and expand, Lord. Lord, all the works that you want to expand in this world before you come, Lord. Yes. That your kingdom might be full to the max and nobody lost out. Lord, you use this brother and just continue to fill him with your spirit and guide him step by step, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that you'll bless his business, that everything prospers, and that he will not miss anything you're trying to tell him, that you'll show him. And help us also to be like that, Lord, to be able to hear from you and to walk and to trust you and to do what you want us to do. But we thank you for this, Lord Jesus, and we ask this in your name. Amen. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for blessing this man. I believe he read your word in Psalm 34, and he took part of that psalm and wrote it on his heart. Yes, Lord. And those words are, taste and see that the Lord is good. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Amen. I pray a blessing in Jesus. Praise God. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Jesus. Lord bless you. Move. And guide and keep you. Amen. Every time.